Going to call the uh, study session to order. Will the city clerk uh, please call the roll? The record will reflect that council members Rosansky and Webb are absent. Okay, we expect uh, probably to see both of them shortly, I believe. Uh, let's uh, go to items of clarification on the consent calendar. Council member Daigle. Uh, yes, just needed a clarification on number 12. It talks about the sculpture park or the sculpture garden, and there's no uh, map attached, and I'm wondering um, what the boundaries here, here, of that here. park will be. Oh, there is one? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I missed that. Okay. And, and, and the question is, uh, the, the museum's area is basically the park area, and carved out from that is the central green between the parking structure and the city hall, plus the plaza area where the meeting room is uh, and the council chambers and the parking entrance uh, uh, leading to the city hall. Okay, and that's all um, delineated on the map for some reason yes. I don't have. Okay. Thank you. Any uh, council, any other questions? Council Member Gardner. Uh, on number 14, on the second page, it says the county will establish guest mooring fees over county tidelands and the city will adopt these fees for city guest moorings in the city's fee schedule. Is this the norm? Is this what we've always done? I'm going to ask Chris to help answer that. No. Um, the, um, our rental fees, actually, yes, our, our rental fees have been established by the county for years, and um, um, even over city tidelands. Um, this year, they've been making a push to increase those fees for rentals, and they're ready to do it. And um, um, since, they're in, since they're in charge of our mooring fields, um, they suggest that they make the recommendations to the county to increase the fees, and, and then we would go along with it. Um, it just worked out that way in the negotiations. But historically, they have been the same fee? They um, have, and they've been, have. Um, they've been uh, $5 per night uh, for... 20 years. I think we can raise that. Yeah. <laughs> Safely. For, for guest, that's for guest transient rentals. Hey, I take $5 a night <laughs> just about any place. Okay. I, I think they're suggesting increasing it to 15 to 20, depending on the season. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Webb, any uh, questions related to the uh, consent calendar? Well, thank you. Okay. Councilmember Selich. I have none. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Hand. Uh, actually, I have uh, uh, several. So <clears throat> following on to Councilwoman Daigle's uh, question about item number 12, uh, Dave, I, we had spoken earlier, will you be able to show us in more detail um, where the public art display areas are on the city controlled portion? Uh, yes, Mr. Hen, we'll have that for you tonight, a blow up of that uh, diagram so you can look at it a little more closely. Okay, uh, then I'll then I'll be wanting to pull that tonight okay. to just just to give us a better look and a better understanding of where the city controlled areas are. Um, and then on uh, item number, uh, I'm sort of jumping around here on item number 15. Um, I think it's a it's it's an important it ought to be I think is an important objective of the city to facilitate the rebuilding of docks around our harbor, <clears throat> and. It may be that we have an opportunity here to help with that, and I'm, what I'm uh, asking is, as it relates to the anchor QEA engineering uh, contract that we're being asked to approve, does it make sense to include private pier areas along the Rhine Channel in the engineering work that's done in order to facilitate the possibility of private pier owners uh, to redo their docks along the way with the engineering being done, perhaps, than for the city to also be reimbursed for a portion of its cost of that engineering work. So, Chris, can you comment on that? I think that would be a good idea. Um, however, we are up against a very tight time frame, um, a very aggressive schedule to um, become shovel ready by mid January 2011. In order to do that, a lot of things have to come into place. And um, that might be a good idea if we would tack that on uh, as, as, a, as some, something to do after January. Um, but to try and squeeze it in right now, I, I think it would compromise our schedule for um, working in the major portion of the Rhine. There's a lot to do. And, and even Anchor, admittedly, is up against the wall there. They, they admit it's a tough schedule to follow as it is. Are there any efficiencies for them to do it? 
uh, if there were time, would there be efficiencies associated with doing this at the time they're doing the other engineering in that in that channel? There might be some, um, but I, but my guess is not not significant. Um, each individual property has its own idiosyncrasies. The wall, the sea walls are in varying states of, well, either they're new or they're old or somewhere in between. The records are very spotty. So we don't, we don't really have a good idea. So each individual property would have to be individualized or individually assessed from a structural standpoint, both from the seawall and for the uh, docks. And I, and I think that would be very labor intensive. So I'm, I'm not sure if we would get too many uh, economies of scale by doing it now. Would we have a, some time, though, Chris, to take a look with Anchor and let's say if, if it involved more staff on their part or more hours or that we could at least come back uh, to the council if indeed it was something that was possible either now or January, we could cost that out and maybe return back. I'd be happy to, sure. Okay. I, I have a question related to the Rhine Channel. How wide is the channel and how wide is the space between the edge of the channel and the bulkhead that you're not going to to look at it. I'm, I'm having a hard time uh, visualizing how you can do the, the center part of this area without also uh, doing the edges. Well, that's one of our engineering tasks that we're uh, figuring out right now. It's called the offset distance between the bulkhead and the dredge uh, zone. Um, I, don't, I, I should have the width of the Rhine Channel at the top of my head, but I don't. But let's just say it's uh, 150 feet. That probably sounds about reasonable, perhaps. Um, we're, we're guessing right now, and the engineers or anchors figuring it out right now, that that offset zone will probably be somewhere in the 30-foot range. And so um, 30 feet from the bulkhead to the dredge line which means that we are going to be going um, underneath um, some of the docks by maybe 10 feet or so, as far as we can, so that we're not jeopardizing or compromising the integrity of the seawalls um, for the same reason that I was mentioning to Council Member Hen. So we want to be really careful because they're in varying states of, of age. And um, well, I, I'm aware of that because I know in the New Potter Island area, the seawalls are very shallow. And we can't yeah. dredge up against them. We have to right. establish a, a sand slope. And I, in this particular area, I, I'm a, I know where a lot of the really older ones are. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just kind of curious about how close we're really talking about. Because about even if, even if uh, the private property owner wants to dredge under his dock, he may not be able to if the bulkhead uh, is not deep enough for him to do that. Or he would have to um, do a new bulkhead. well do a new bulkhead. Certainly, we would hope that they would want to do that, or they would do what they did in Port Wainimi um, a couple years ago, where they would dredge out at the seawall, and then within within 48 hours they had to replace clean sand abutted right up to that seawall so that it wouldn't fall. So it, it's it's in, it, it's possible from an engineering perspective, but it's very tricky when you have to take sand away, take sediment, and then import and um, but it can be done. You probably have to do that at the time when there's the least tidal fluctuation, I would imagine. That, uh, I, I would think so, too. But well, it, it wouldn't be an easy engineering feat. Well, but, it, but in any event, it sounds like we're a little bit shooting in the dark here. And so if you have the opportunity to get a more informed answer on that, I, I think that would be a good thing to do, sure, I might, whether now or later. So. I'll, I'll try to after the meeting. And then. Uh, with regard to the two software items, items number eight and number ten, the item number eight is the uh, computer-aided dispatch system for the police department. Um, <clears throat> I recognize that that is one of the most critical life safety systems that the police department, maybe the city, operates. And so I, I know we need to keep that in good shape. On the other hand, as a part of the uh, technology committee work. I know that the computer-aided dispatch system has been identified as a system that may well need to be replaced. And as the technology committee completes its work and makes recommendations and perhaps we get to the point of a strategic plan for our technology for the city, if it turned out that that system was a one of the first that to be identified that it would need to be replaced, you know, I wonder about spending $120,000 right now today on that. So 
I, I would I don't know the answer to this, but I would like some more illumination of that. Point. <laughs> and then I'll also want to talk about the PBNR parks uh, uh, system too. Okay. So. Chief. Mayor Curry, uh, Council Member Hen, members of the City Council. Uh, I can give you a, a general answer. And, and basically what we are faced with in asking for this upgrade is that none of our workstations now um, can be upgraded without going to the uh, Windows XP format. So uh, let's say we have six workstations in the CAD Center. One of them goes down, and we need to put a new computer in there. We can't go out and buy a new computer uh, to, to utilize at that workstation. Uh, so basically, if we start with six and one of them goes down, we're down to five. If we then lose another one, we're down to four. And under the best of conditions, even I would imagine, um, if the first project was to upgrade the police CAD system, which is the backbone of our dispatch system. Uh, best case scenario, it's probably a year, maybe a year and a half, maybe two years out. And, um, and I don't think we want to run the risk of having uh, potentially our entire CAD system go down because we're unable to upgrade it. So mm -hmm. that's why this is before you today. We think the $121,000, well, it's significant, is um, pales in comparison to where we could be left if we didn't do it. Does that? I understand that yeah. response. You know, the, the, as a follow-on, and this may not be for you to answer, Chief, okay. but uh, I, I also heard, saw in the memo, though, that previous attempts to upgrade to Office 2007, in effect, failed. I think that's what it was, yes. essentially cutting through the verbiage in the memo. And isn't Northrop Grumman, is there some argument here that Northrop Grumman bears some of the responsibility for the failure of that upgrade to Windows 2007? And if so, shouldn't they bear some of the cost of this software upgrade that we have to sort of patch into, you know, XP Professional isn't exactly the latest system. No, no it's <laughs> not. And if, if we had our druthers, we'd go right to Windows 7. Right. Uh, and, but you ha uh, the, the answer to that is that our CAD system is old. You know, yeah. they have new versions out of CAD software. Um, they call it uh, Command Point, $5.5 million, okay? So we haven't upgraded. And uh, we've looked at, we've looked at uh, Command Point, we've looked at Tiburon, and we looked at one other vendor. But the price is like between three and a half and five million dollars, which is a significant investment. And so we've, we've tried to get along with what we have. Now we've reached that point where um, our workstations are no longer upgradable uh, based on, on the 2000 operating system. So we have to make that move to XP. We would love to have a new CAD system, but I think you're right. We need to take a look at it in conjunction with all the other uh, needs of the city, technological needs of the city, factor it in, and then see where we go from there. So. There's, there's no point in exploring with Northrop Grumman why they shouldn't bear some of the cost of helping us get an, a, an outdated generation software that will work on a temporary basis. I, I, I think they would, they would tell us we will be happy to move you into the new version software yeah. and, and you have um, maximized the potential of what you purchased from us. Mm -hmm. I think that might be their answer. <laughs> Well, it may be worth an exploration of that question. Yeah. We I mean, well, I mean we, can, we can uh, definitely I realize back. that Northrop Grumman has all the leverage in this situation because we yeah. can't do without right. that system right now. But um, maybe it's worth some leverage, some discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and unfortunately, in my experience, um, there are very few CAD vendor providers out yeah. there. And so, I mean, it makes in my experience, very little difference whether you're going to Northrop Grumman or Tiburon or another provider. Uh, eventually, it all comes around to the same thing. It's like pulling into the gas pump. You're going to pay the same price. Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, Chief. Yes, sir. Um, with regard to item number 10 on uh, parks, beaches, and recreation, I guess the, the one thing that didn't, there are two things that didn't read through in the memo to me. One was the criticality of need to replace this system <clears throat> might have something to do with the payment mechanism connection. I'm not sure. But also there was no clear view of what the cost of that new system is. I know there was a clear view of we're going to raise our fee to our customers by two bucks, you know, a transaction. Um, but there was nothing in there that said, and that, and that means that the system cost X and so forth. So whether we pay for it or our residents pay for it, there's a cost of that new system, and how critical is it? Okay, well, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. And to answer your questions, Council Member Hen, there's, there's a long list of reasons why we feel this is the best time to move forward with this upgrade. Uh, one being that we've been put on notice by the active network that we will no longer uh, have support as of 2012. Uh, we're no longer uh, able to enhance the system that we have right now. Uh, it, it's been about a year process to this date, so it's a lengthy process to get the software up and running. It'll probably be about four months of training uh, and to get our system turned over. Uh, so there's about a year and a half left until we completely lose support of the existing system that we have. So that's one reason. Additionally, there are some new standards when it comes to hand handling credit card information. It's called PCI compliance. Uh, we're supposed to be compliant as of July 1. We're getting close to that date, obviously. Uh, there can be some pretty hefty fines set down by the banks if we don't meet that compliance and the, there's some mishandling of information. Uh, the system that we're proposing to upgrade to is much more robust than what we have. Uh, we believe it's going to be mu much more customer friendly to our customers, to the contractors that we work with. Uh, the system will give us uh, a, a, an unlimited amount of access to information out in the field. We'll be able to access it at all of our facilities out at our pools. Our park patrol staff will be able to access it as well. Uh, so it, it, the timing felt good because of the uh, prorating they're going to be giving us, giving us two years of life back on the system that we currently have, uh, and it will give us some time to kind of get ahead of the curve and, and get our system updated. In terms of costs, uh, there will no, be no increase to the general fund uh, with the upgrade of this system. We're currently paying out about $100,000 a year right now between credit card and maintenance fees. Uh, we've negotiated a lower credit card rate, uh, a set rate of 2.25, which will decrease some of those fees. We've also proposed to raise the administrative fee by $2, which, is, uh, which will be paid by the user when they register for a class. Uh, and in, in addition to the to prorating for two years, those have brought our costs down to make sure that there was no increase uh, of those fees to the general fund. So it's a combination of efforts to keep those costs limited to make this upgrade. Well, but, so the general fund will have no net impact, but our residents will have a net impact. That is correct. Equal to $2,000 or $2, $2 per transaction yes. times how many transactions a year? Mm, do you have another note? 15, About 15000 so that, that fee was set 10 years ago. It has not seen an increase. It was put there to help us manage this system when we purchased it, uh, knowing that it's kind of, I kind of equate it to dog years when you're looking at software, to have a software that, that, you've, that you've been using for 10 years that's now knowingly not going to get any enhancements. We're starting to see some limitations with it, uh, with our user groups, trying to access information, reporting, those types of things. Uh, there will be some increase to it and in, in sharing that load between our customers and some of the negotiations we've done with this contract, uh, we feel it's you know, the best method to move forward with right now. Okay. Well, you know, in both of these cases, I think we're seeing illustrations of why the work of the Technology Committee is important right now on behalf of the city, and I, and I think that uh, we're going to see a good report out of that group because it's really critical that we have a, an IT strategic plan to give context to these kinds of expenditures. Um, we really need to have a strategy for identifying what are the most critical systems, what are the most critical systems in need of replacement or upgrade, and a thoughtful approach to all of that in light of 
all the changes that are going on in the technology environment. So, and I will share with you that we've we've shared this information with the committee. They were in full support of it. We work very closely with the finance department as well. It'll okay. integrate with our system, whereas our, our current software does not. So there are a lot of things pointing to this being the right answer uh, for the city uh, into in the you know next century. So. Okay. That's a long time. It is a long time. The great thing about the <coughs> software is they'll continue to enhance it without additional cost to us. You mean the current century because the next century is still 90 years away. Yeah, <laughs> current. That's why I say it's a long time. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks. Okay, uh, Mr. Rosansky, do you have any uh, items for the <coughs> city calendar? Nothing, thank you. All right, and uh, I have uh, no items, but if you are watching at home and are interested in S26, which is the Hogue, uh, development agreement, I understand that's going to be continued to July 27th, and we'll discuss that in the council meeting when it comes up. So. Mr. Mayor, I have one comment on a con another consent item. Uh, I just one you, you've spoken about a little bit tonight, consent item 15. You do have before you a, a change to the Gantt chart um, that uh, staff and public works have proposed. Um, I, it's fairly minor, but when this is included, I'm hoping this is the actual uh, chart that's included in the final action. I'll remind yeah. you of that tonight. Okay, thank you. Next item is the 2010-11 uh, budget adoption, Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. We're um, handing you up the copy of the PowerPoint uh, that I'll go through. I know how um, tedious PowerPoints can be, so I'm going to try to go through it briefly and also allow you to have a copy that you can thumb uh, through back and forth. One to the City Clerk. <laughs> uh, it's always tr the lights are always tricky for we'll go with whatever you give us Mr. Selich <laughs> yeah I think we need <laughs> that's fine actually that will work oh they do okay <laughs> I'll just roll on through here um, I'm going to start by reviewing what we did in 2009, 2010. For the audience at home, remember, that's the fiscal year we're in now. It ends in just a few days. It ends ju June 30th. Back in the fall, we projected a deficit of about $5.5 million. Over time, that increased to about $8 million in January 2010. And when I say it increased, what usually happens is we keep spending a certain level, but our revenue projections, the sales tax, hotel bed tax, tend to be a little bit lower than we thought, and we were fairly conservative in that anyway. So we immediately took some corrective actions. We sent uh, about 52 people off on an early retirement program. Um, the council here in, in January adopted what's called the fiscal sustainability policy uh, by a resolution that directed us to do certain things along these lines. We went through an organizational review to identify savings. And then importantly, and I'm going to talk about this a couple of times, is uh, we're getting some um, good movement by the labor groups, including the Firefighters Association and the Lifeguard Management, to start paying more for their pension costs. So all of those helped uh, reduce some of our costs there. So continuing on corrective actions, we deferred some capital improvement projects. We um, looked at our internal service funds, that's an ISF, and uh, moved a num uh, about 618000 uh, to the general fund back to free it up and there's a good reason we did that that involves uh, our street sweeping program so um, we'll talk a little bit more about that too I mentioned we, we also did re renegotiate with our vendors to do um, to have them especially in general services do things a little bit differently and tighten up their own costs uh, we also as I mentioned we, we contracted out street sweeping was able, we're able to save some money that way we also raised some fees Parking meters and parking lots, uh, those went up. But I always point out that parking permits for residents of Newport, those are the same price. So you can always get a parking permit and avoid those increased fees. The result, I think, is a good news story. We're going to conclude the year with a zero deficit. So it was five and a half, then it was eight, now it's zero. So no borrowing of reserves in this fiscal year. T touch really briefly on what we do contract out. P sometimes people forget how much we do. Our tree trimming is out. About half of our park maintenance is contracted out. Municipal service building, alley sweeping, storm drain cleaning, the refuse trucks that take the our tr our trash from the transfer from the yard 
um, out to the um, materials recovery facility. That's uh, done by a contractor. Uh, we, as you, you, the council is aware, we, we're contracting out street sweeping now, water meter reading. You just heard a presentation about that last week, uh, two weeks ago. And then we'll keep looking at this. Parking meters are under consideration, beach trash can pickup and more. So let's look, uh, we're gonna spend a little bit more time looking at the last year, because I think in spite of this, we did a number of good things. We continued providing really good customer service at um, our libraries, rec and senior services and city hall, in fact, didn't have any closures, no reduction in hours, nor reduction in programs officer offered. Even the Easter Bunny survived this year. Um, most, and yet this was a pretty challenging budget process. As noted, we, we figured we balanced an $8 million gap um, and we're looking at uh, getting close to balancing, if not balancing, the $12 million gap for the coming fiscal year. Even doing this with reduced staffing, too. Um, we mentioned we increased some revenue over that time. That's never easy for you folks as council. Um, we maintain our building inspection service levels and our plan review uh, um, standards. As noted, we completed negotiations, difficult negotiations, with uh, the firefighters and lifeguard management. And now we're about done with uh, police employees and police management and uh, the Association of Newport Beach Ocean Lifeguards. Those are our seasonals. We completed the CNG fueling station at no cost to the city. Um, most folks all say we still have the best refuse collection service around. Finished our water rate study. Uh, we adopted your, the water conservation ordinance resulting in a 20% reduction. We implemented our USAR program in fire. We're working on the succession planning in fire. Improved our promotional process for PD. Um, just today, sworn in this morning, a new um, police sergeant, police lieutenant, and police captain under this new pro process, which um, a lot of great work done by the city attorney and HR and police to make that happen. And indeed, we uh, were able to recruit a, a great police chief candidate who starts July 3rd. He was at the promotionals too, just to meet folks. Um, complete about 30 different CIP projects, which you heard about last time. So looking forward, it's a tough year, but I think we've made a lot of tough choices already to make it easier. So back in January, we projected about $11.7 million deficit and for the public. Four million of that is not an operational expense. It's a one-time capital project that we just spoke about, the Rhine Channel dredging. We took some early corrective actions. Um, one thing that th there are some revenues looking brighter um, so that helped reduce um, that deficit. We're, w those operational reductions that we did in the current fiscal year continue. Um, so that includes the ERIP, but it's more than just that, and that's about a $4. million reduction. Uh, we have more internal service fund surpluses that are eligible to move back. Continued contract renegotiation, and then the full impacts of those fee increases, especially on parking. As a result, um, the overall operating budget has gone down by 18.6 million between last fiscal year and this one. So that's an important note, I think, to remember. And um, we have a, some more operational reductions to go through, but there's a path to do that. And that's about, of that 11 million, about 2 million is left to really put a finer point on. We're gonna do that with labor negotiations. Um, you folks, I may have seen that Costa Mesa is moving towards cutting in half the hours that the uh, helicopter will fly. Um, we will therefore likely do that too because it's a joint system. Um, we're looking at an assessment of our fire and lifeguards. So um, you, the council has directed me and I think we can achieve a zero deficit for the next fiscal year. This is a summary, it's a little hard to read on the screen, but it's in your packet of where, what that $18 million looks like. In other words, that's the, chain, the change from the proposed budget to the adjusted budget that we ended up adopting in mid-year. So $18 million reduction. You could see too where the, the full-time equivalent count has gone down as well. Uh, year to year, about 35 positions, full-time equivalent positions. I'm gonna uh, jump through now. The proposed CIP budget, which you've heard about already, is about $51 million involving a wide variety of projects. Um, looking at the historical trend for CIP, the average is about 35 million a year budgeted. You can kind of see where that's gone. We're, we were up here, now we're down to here. 
but we're staying above the historical trend. Um, this always makes, brings a question about the Civic Center project and how that plays into it. I want to remind folks how that works. Um, the Civic Center project, remember it's uh, at least four major components, a library expansion, a parking structure, a city hall, and what would be our, our uh, city's fifth largest park. Um, we've incurred some expenses along those lines to date, including uh, things that are coming up soon, like the parking structure. That'll be the first thing built. We're doing mass excavation and grading. So that those expenses, again, roughly $30 million over the past three years, and the, the newest ones are coming in now. Those are the high expenses, again, the grading and the mass X and the parking. Um, those will be rolled into um, an issuance of certificates of participations uh, planned for November and December. That will reimburse these previous expenses. It funds the major project components remaining, about 90 million roughly. Again, this all depends on what happens with our bids when they come in in November. And then it sets aside a debt service reserve. It'll help fund the cost of issuance too. So you move from the COP issuance, then you have the COPs issued, and then we go into what we've all been referring to as the facilities financing plan. And that's a program that in effect starts uh, with the issuance of the debt. It has a debt repayment program that is less than f up to 5% of the general fund operating expen expenses. Um, as we start moving along, we'll see things like uh, developer fees coming in. Those help reduce the amount of the next borrowing. Um, so, um, but the, the, the initial borrowing itself has to go all to the construction costs associated with the Civic Center. Remember, there's seed money going into the facilities financing plan. That's about $27.5 million right now. So that's cash that helps this amount stay low over time. So let me talk a little bit about the debt instrument. Get questions about this too. These are certificates of participation or COPs, most commonly used by local governments in California. They're lease obligations. Unlike general obligation bonds, they don't require an increase in local taxes. Uh, the interest is low because it's typically tax exempt to the holders. Um, and, the, and as I noted before, the city's FFP, the facilities financing plan, uh, speaks to us never going above 5% of our general fund budget, which is a very low ratio. Um, you're going to hear us talk about the COPs in the context of Build America bonds or BABs. It's not a done deal that we're going to use BABs as the vehicle um, to issue the COPs, but um, these are authorized under the Stimulus Act of, of 2009. They're very commonly used across the country now. Um, these are actually taxable instruments. They, um, the city would receive as a subsidy from the federal government equal to 35% um, of the interest paid. And as a result, we can issue bonds that, um, that pay interest rates that are competitive with the rates paid by corporations. And this is a decision that is purely economic. It'll be valued right before, evaluated right before pricing. In today's market, these could provide, what, a 40 to 50 basis point advantage over tax exempt uh, COPs. And this is from our financial advisors as well as the mayor's own um, uh, looking at that. So the transaction might include both tax-exempt COPs and taxable BAB COPs in the longer maturities, just to be really confusing. <laughs> so um, I'm going to welcome your questions on that as we move forward. I'm going to move next to staffing levels. Dave, Dave yes. before, before we move off of the Civic Center, so in the CIP right now, it's, we show about a million dollars of spending for the Civic Center and Oasis, but there's – 90 million dollars ahead of us. I mean, I, that's so, right. So why is it that in the fiscal year 10-11, there's only one million dollars of CIP spending related to the Civic Center? Because you will see the larger, um, <clears throat> the larger amount coming to you as a budget amendment when okay. the um, when the bids come in in November and then when the bonds are issued. Okay. So that's right. the question I know you'll get asked in the public, and it's a uh, helpful that you ask it so now. It's, it's coming. It's we just coming. haven't got the That's numbers right. in there. Okay. So let's talk about staffing levels, historical trends. This is kind of where the city's gone over time. Uh, we were up at 832, then 833, now down to 805. Um, your budget proposes a one net 
uh, position increase to 806. This is if you look at it in full-time equivalents. Remember, we're a community, a city that hires a lot of part-time people. So I always think this is actually the better indicator from 975 to 943 and then to 940. Remember, the part-time people are our seasonal lifeguards, library pages. We have a, a, a lot of folks that add up um, to a full-time equivalent position. Um, this is a slide you have in your chart, and it's something, if there's anything that keeps city managers awake at night, it's this chart, and it looks at the city's retirement contributions moving forward. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. I will spend a lot of time on it with you in the coming months because um, our city is in, in good shape to deal with this, but we need some significant changes in the retirement system, and I worry if I was... If, if we were in another city right now, um, these kinds of charts would be terrifying. Indeed, we were just reading in the paper today where Maywood is basically closing up shop and contracting everything out to another city. And I think it's in part because of these kinds of obligations that are coming ahead. So I don't minimize this chart. I want to, we have a little, a short window to work with you on it and work with our labor groups, but it's very significant. Um, let's talk about the impacts of reduced staffing levels quite briefly. These are things we'll monitor closely in the coming year. And I, I didn't want to leave you with the impact, that the thought that these budget cuts did nothing to city government. Um, they did something, but they've protected essential services. But I wanted to make you aware of other possible impacts. We're going to, we end up, we're ended up having a slightly decreased street repair activity, some increased response time for some beach crew calls. This is general services. Um, a little bit less sidewalk and curb and gutter repair. The tri tree trim cycle has gone from once every three years to now once every four. And you're going to see some service level reductions in landscape maintenance contracts. But these are things, again, we'll be watching closely with the budget because we know how important it is that Newport Beach looks like Newport Beach. So we'll, the management team will watch it closely with you. And we want to hear from you, too, if you see um, areas where, where we're slipping. Um, little comments about changes in fire and lifeguards. The uh, lifeguard building, the, the headquarters, is in, in pretty sorry shape, so uh, we're going to need to address that fairly quickly. And in police, there, is, there are some staffing changes in police. They're not in the rank and file sworn officers, so we'll be watching certainly in overtime if we're holding too many vacancies. We there'll be some decrease in some community outreach. Um, I mentioned ABLE. Um, and how that will impact things. Remember, the police department and I see ABLE as a force multiplier. There's been a couple of examples just the past two weeks where the helicopter helped catch the bad guys, uh, leaving banks in Corona del Mar and finding them up in Long Beach. That's an important tool, so um, uh, I'm obviously I'm cautious about that. These are the proposed staffing changes in what I'm calling a position checklist, which I'm going to ask you to vote on tonight. You could see where there's a couple of additions and three decreases, leaving that uh, net uh, one position increase. Uh, there's a chart in there that uh, council members have asked for involving the Office of the City Attorney. If you have questions, I'll certainly allow you to, uh, uh, David Hunt, to jump in on that. There's a list that you've asked for before about positions being reclassified. These are as a result of the ERIP. Some are pending. We haven't made the decision on them yet. I'm not asking you to decide individually on these reclasses. Indeed, if you adopt the budget, you'd allow me to do these, but I'm not doing them all now. Um, again, oftentimes it involves an existing position changing its title, and that's what we've looked at in terms of the ERIP, to try to do things with different people and do things differently. Councilmember Member Gardner. Uh, figures you give monthly salary ranges, but how does this compare? There's no comparison as to Between what adding? they're moving from? Yeah. Uh, we, can, we can get you a summary of that in time for tonight. Thanks. You should be able to. Okay. I um, wanted to just remind you of some council policies issues that you've directed us to do. We are proposing a change to policy A12 tonight. Um, A12 involves your discretionary grants. And uh, the Finance Committee and, and, uh, ha has been good, at least, in sending this signal that we think the 7,000 should go down to six to show that even the discretionary grants are taking a bit of a haircut. Um, 
Policy 812 also requires that we show you the public the following slide, and this is in your packets too. This is, uh, the policy says that at least once a year we need to show the public where your discretionary grants went. So that's a summary there. Uh, and uh, there's no chance to spend any more money. Uh, so. I have a question though. <laughs> <laughs> because. Did I, we miss your, your There was something for Oasis uh, for their computers. Oh, uh, okay. Okay, we'll catch that. Okay, fun. I just want to be sure that it does get in there. That you direct it out of yours. Okay. Right. Do you remember the amount? 2500 uh, Okay. There goes the balanced budget. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, another policy that's within the budget, but we're not asking you to act on it because it's fairly elaborate, and I don't want to spend time on this. You've directed us in the past to relook at how we deal with special events and fee waivers. So expect to see that come back to you soon with the actual amendments to the policies. Um, another thing that um, I'll ask you to look at tonight is the what we're calling community cash grants. This is where you support a specific entity, often with sponsorship or other assistance. I'd point out um, Greg Schwenk is here with the Newport Beach Film Festival. I know Greg will want to speak in a little bit. Greg reminded me that my chart in the staff report that went out to the public was wrong. Um, the, the Special Events Advisory Committee actually recommended a 105.5 funding for the film festival for the coming year. Um, there's no, there was no um, rocket science associated with the numbers I came up with. I'm just trying to keep costs down as best I can. Uh, on these, I know we're going to discuss them in more detail, but is the plan that, I mean, uh, the marathon and the film festival have been through this new process. Is the plan that regardless of whether we approve amounts or not, that these would also, these others listed would also go through that process? Um, remember the, pro the special event advisory committee is supposed to deal with things that are get 20,000 or more. I would like to change that in your policies to say maybe keep that same number, but it also includes fee waivers. So it's not just cash. Okay. So most of the, a, a number of these would go through that process. Um, the three on the top, four on the top probably would not because I don't think they get anything waived. But others might. Okay, thank you. I don't think irrelevant we would either. We see this as a one-time request, I think. Um, I want to talk to you just because you've brought this up. The council member uh, Webb brought this up last time. Um, we will move forward in this budget year with um, as soon as possible, and that may mean in a few days versus a few weeks, if directed tonight to add the $70,000 cost of the new mooring contract to mooring fees. I just didn't want to do it tonight without uh, thoroughly discussing this with the city attorney to make sure my noticing was correct. So we'll do that as soon as we can, if, if directed tonight. Um, I'm about to wrap up with kind of the cautions about what to expect in the coming year. You'll, you'll see more frequent revenue and expenditure updates from us as we watch sales tax and property tax and hotel bed tax. You'll see the up, uh, a greater update, update to the harbor charges. Um, uh, I, I'm going to ask the council at the next meeting to appoint an ad hoc committee to work with me on that. You'll see performance-based budgeting. That's something that uh, Dana Smith and Tracy McCraner will be working on. You'll see those improvements to the special events process. Good news, you'll see OASIS completed. So um, that ties into the budget because there's a position associated with that. We mentioned the Build America bonds, labor negotiations. Um, we do have a final vote in from PEA, but not PMA. Um, we do hope to, uh, they, they, have, uh, tenet, they have agreed to the uh, term sheet that we're working on. Um, we hope to have those MOUs before you on July 6th. Remember, um, July 6th is a meeting, uh, your next meeting instead of July 3rd, 13th, just since we're talking about it. You'll see labor negotiations with all the miscellaneous groups. That's the, the larger groups of employees. Mention the organizational assessments. Um, you can never leave a slide like this without talking about PERS and our PERS assumptions. Uh, you folks saw in your council newsletter that PERS will be doing a number of things over the next couple of months. They may decide that People are living longer, and therefore our, our uh, rate assumption will go up. They may decide that the rate of investment return, uh, traditionally set at, what, 7.25 or 7.75, is too high. I think it is too high. If it goes down, our purse costs go up. Um, all things that, that, again, keep a city manager awake at night. 
So you'll see us report back to you with um, those actions and uh, possible uh, mitigating actions that inevitably will involve changes to the pension program and the way we fund it here. And that's the third bullet down. Uh, this, this has got to happen statewide for it to be successful. Um, and I know it will be happening statewide. It's a question of whether it will be on a ballot or the legislature and the governor do it. Actually, if the legislature and governor do it, we'll struggle with that. Dave, I don't think they'll succeed. Dave, I, uh, my understanding from the newsletter is that the, the PERS board has adopted those actuarial changes, so they will have impact on us. And, and we need to see what it will look like as soon as we get those numbers. Yeah, yeah. and so yeah. I was just going to ask that I know we've got a finance committee agenda item that's going to be dealing with the pension costs, and I'd just like to make sure we quantify the dollar impact of those actuarial changes as we're going along in that. Okay. Um, because because this is on top of the yes. already known pension cost increases of $6 million ultimately that are going to hit us. Right? Exactly. You, you can't uh, underemphasize that. That's a... Uh, that's a really scary number and a scary combination, but it, it's the reality of the pension programs nationwide right now. Um, the state of California, of course, will be dealing with its budget. We'll see how they do and what they do to local governments. I just note there is something on the November ballot, the league initiative, a number of the council members here were active in supporting that to help protect our, our funds. Uh, that would take effect, hopefully not too late, hopefully soon. So in summary, uh, the 2009-10 budget we think is going to be balanced. And I say we think because you've got to look at what happens with fund balance. We've been really tight about holding back our expenditures. Those early retirements helped a lot. So uh, we'll report back to you as to what, what fund balance looks like. But uh, we're, we're, all the experts in this room are saying we'll close with, the, without, with a balanced budget and essential services protected. Again, we think the coming year's budget you'd adopt tonight, a high deficit projection. We've addressed um, at least $9 million of that. I'm confident I can address the remainder of that so that you can adopt what, what we would consider to be a balanced budget as well. I, I will need a few months to implement those kinds of things, and I'll report back to you frequently. But there are still uncertain economic times ahead, and caution is required. So with that, um, there's also a reserve slide. You could see we're holding the same level of reserves there in the end. Um, we have about $5 million for PERS rate charges. That will go away in a second um, uh, if, if the, the PERS uh, tidal wave comes. And then the bottom line there, that's the amount of money. Um, Council Mayor Pro Tem Hen had asked about this before. We'll have about $30 million to transfer into the FFP. We could take out $5 million in cash and finish up Oasis which is probably where we're headed. So that number, again, will be about $25 million. So recommended actions tonight. You're going to straw vote a couple of things, the position control, the community cash grants, and the budget checklist. Then you would adopt the budget. I'm going to jump through here because this is the same – I'm going to put these in front of you tonight, just the end of it. I don't want to bore you with the whole thing, obviously, a second time. Um, you're going to hopefully authorize us to apply any increase in mooring admin costs to the Harbor Patrol contract, approve the resolution adopting the budget, <coughs> approve some res that the revisions to A12, direct us to return to spe with special event policy changes. And then finally, I didn't talk about this too much. This is something May Mayor Pro Tem might. Um, in the, if the event that we do have additional fund balance available, the mayor has asked that um, – uh, additional revenues be sent to the design completion for the Balboa Theater. Recall that we own that property. Um, and then uh, also the Mayor Pro Tem has asked me a couple of times about finding some funds for the wayfinding program, and we may be able to do that. I hate to open a door, um, but um, I do what you tell me. So with that, I'm done. Welcome some questions. Sorry to drone on as long as I do there. Thank you, Mr. Kiff. That was an excellent and comprehensive uh, presentation. And I think the salient points here are that we are finishing a year where we had an $8 million deficit with a zero deficit, and we have done so without drawing down our reserves, and that we are proposing to reduce our spending from last year and in going into next year by $18 million, 8.7 of which is coming right out of operations costs. So I think uh, that's a significant accomplishment. And one we're able to do, as you pointed out, without reducing our public safety services, 
uh, in any meaningful way, or our library hours or our core recreation services. Now, I know there's a lot of questions by uh, some of my colleagues, and so why don't we start first on the position, uh, uh, position control and the recommended changes to the positions. And Councilmember Daigle, I know you've had some questions in this area. I, I just have some other questions I know um, Councilwoman Gardner had. She was kind of angry. I don't know if you have. Okay. Um, uh, my questions were more accounting. I have an accounting question. I think Tracy can help me out with that. Okay. Um, I know we've been on kind of a treasure hunt to find out what all these um, legal expenses are, and it seems as if the city has lots of different account numbers, 8084, 8080 and so on, and some of these account numbers, one from the public could not possibly identify what the numbers are. So for example, the 8080, it's just a blend of costs. Um, so my first question is, um, in terms of simplifying our accounting and providing just an, an easier path for people to follow and transparency, do you have any ideas on that? aspect? Yes, Tracy McCraner, Director of Admin Services. I've been working with um, Susan and our budget group and we are going to identify a specific account for legal services. The 8080 is actually a combination of all professional and technical service contracts and in order to get you some data that you desired, you know, Susan pretty much had to scrub vendor by vendor through that. So we are going to institute that change. We're actually looking at our entire chart of accounts as part of our performance-based budgeting uh, measure. So we're just going to incorporate that change along with the others to make that easier to identify. Because I know some comments were made, for example, about information technology, and I can just imagine, you know, the treasure hunt that that we is. We actually just set up. All those about accounts. a half a dozen new IT accounts so that okay. citywide in an effort to do more of a consolidation and a citywide view of how much do we spend on IT, we've already incorporated that to start July 1st as well. Okay. And then um, a couple. Member, if I may, to, to address that question too. We also instituted some significant changes in the Office of the City Attorney's Budget where we don't account attorney's fees to 8080. We account them to some specifically identified accounts. Um, which are now in your new budget and has identified as advisory work, specialty litigation, and code enforcement. I'm surprised by some of these numbers. I've right. never seen these before. Sure. I think I can probably explain some of these. Some of these may not be attorney's fees. So at, at some point, I, okay. I, but I we've think been working you, to achieve that for right. the last year and a half. But I think you would probably support a consolidation of accounts and that we don't have legal monies within administrative accounts. Absolutely. And I think okay. they should all be overseen by the Office of the City okay. Attorney as you previously directed. Okay, I, I have no problem with that, just trying to get this going straight here. And then um, in, in adding up all these costs, it appeared to come to 2.7 million, but what about the $650,000 budget amendment that we recently had? Have you determined where that is? That's part of the 2010. Is? Okay. We, we already uh, increased per your approval of that action their budget. So 450 went directly to the city attorney's general fund budget, and 200 went within public liability, okay. which is part of the other piece of that slide. That okay. Before. So in connection with the finance committee's efforts, then you'll continue to work on the accounting and the performance budget. Absolutely. Okay. And then also in looking at these legal expenses, and, and I would hope that all the council, um, will, that we will be working with both the city manager and the city attorney to rein in some of these costs. And when I look at those costs of 2.78 um, million contrasted with 1.3 million just three years ago, so we have more than doubled our legal expenses in just three years. Um, and as far as reining that in, you know, some of the, the um, ideas that I would see there, for example, the administration of these outside legal billings. And when I look at um, some of these memos, I really wonder what kind of a billing gambit some of these firms are using to uh, build a city. And so I'd like to see a little cl closer work because your department has the accountants and the finance people. If you can also um, become involved with, with some type of scrutiny or oversight of these bills, because I mean, I, I, I see it as really, um, a problem. And then also um, a couple of other things. I think we're now going to be doing risk assessments for all of our litigation. And I'd like to see a more active role by our uh, risk assessment people so that when each litigation matter does come up, uh, we know how we would pay for it if there are damages. Um, and then the other issue would be if we could look at um, a containment policy, and that would 
begin to establish within certain categories, whether it's real property, personal injury, or, or construction defects, some guardrails that we have as far as these litigation matters. So those would be my concerns, and, and I hope that everyone will be uh, working to uh, try to control these costs. Absolutely. And then I had one other question on a couple of items, if that would be okay. Um, on code enforcement, I've been getting a lot of feedback from the community, both residents from Balboa Island to Santa Ana Heights, as well as merchants in Corona Del Mar that were pretty heavy on the code enforcement. And as we discussed, we have 28 employees involved with code enforcement, and you know maybe there, be, there can be a discussion down the line as far as how we sort of calibrate code enforcement, not only from a cost perspective, but how we interact with the community. We can, and when um, I was working with the various departments, uh, there are a lot of people that have assumed certain responsibilities because of ERIP, so it seems like a lot position-wise, 28, but many of them just have a very small percentage of their daily task involved with either code compliance or enforcement. So um, I think we are trying to scale that back, but we just wanted to give an all-encompassing number for anybody who even touches code enforcement. But okay. We'll be working on that, too. Yeah. might be a good discussion. subject, too, for a study session item where where you, the council as a whole, could, it's a good update from where we were a couple of years ago when we changed our code enforcement posture. Okay, okay, that'd be helpful. And then on the um, the Balboa Island Theater, I you know the project's been languishing for many years. I support it going forward, but I do have a question on your hundred seventy five thousand dollars design fees. Would that be a straight pass through to the architect, or how, or would it be an administrative fee by the theater? If you can maybe speak to making sure that we're you know. <clears throat> we, we haven't determined what's the exact mechanism. I wanted to make sure we had funding authorization here, but there is a firm bid uh, that the architect has provided. It was, in fact, an RFP process, and it's a firm bid of 350000 And so we're going to have to determine whether the city would directly contract with the architect and control the funds to him or do that through the Balboa Theater Board. But what, either way, the money would go directly to the architect for the design work to be done and exclusively for that purpose. Okay. I, I appreciate that. Um, I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. What I, what I, just, I, can I just ask, is this when we're just going to discuss the theater or are we going to discuss well, the theater this evening? <clears throat> Thank you, Councilmember Gardner. What I was going to suggest is that I think the city manager has tried to set this up in a structured way so that we can deal first with uh, the positions that have been recommended for either addition or deletion. Secondly, we can deal with the community cash grants. Third, we can deal with the budget checklist. And then I think after that, we want to deal with the two primary items that relate to the Balboa Theater and the signage. Thank you. So that with help. that, uh, uh, the question on the table, there's a table in uh, the flip book that uh, the city manager presented regarding the uh, addition of uh, four positions and deletion of three positions for a total of one net addition. Uh, at issue here, uh, do any of my colleagues have any yes. proposed changes to that? Councilman uh, I just have some questions. Um, I understand the, uh, the one for the recreation, obviously, with the, uh, the Oasis opening, we, we need that. Um, the, the city attorney's office, as uh, Leslie mentioned, has seen uh, an increase in staff and an increase in costs, and at the same time trying to bring down outside litigation costs uh, to make them more manageable. Can you explain how these two positions that are proposed will help us achieve our goal without um, – the, the one thing about outside costs is we don't have pensions with them and we just pay them their hourly fee. When we do hire people, we have all the other things. So can you explain a little bit about how this is going to benefit the city and everything in, in your mission? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we presented a report approximately a year ago where we estimated the actual outside expense for council at approximately 200 weighted outside expense, $208 an hour. That takes into account all the different levels of actual compensation. But the expense for inside legal services, including all pension costs, is $99 an hour. Uh, that has a significant obvious swing. I actually think it may have been up for the outside council expense over the last year. So doing more work inside has the potential for creating great economies for the city. One of the things that we've done over the course of the last year is bring in all code enforcement outside litigation. Only we have not referred a single code enforcement case out and thus taking that out. But what that's done is it's also increased the 
pressure internally on us for handling more litigation. We also held in-house one other case that was sent out during the last three months where we had the difficulty with staffing involving specialty litigation, once related to a Coastal Act case. We're currently playing approximately $280 an hour on that case. Had we been fully staffed, we would be operating with that case fully in-house. That would save us that type of expense. The two, the two positions that we've asked for in the office are paralegal and to, actually it's not a full position for department assistant. It's only like, I think she's right now .45 full-time equivalent, so it's really going up .55 full-time equivalent um, to make that a full-time position. What that does is, for the paralegal, what we've experienced is a lot of the contract review and all the other internal advisory work that has crossed our desk, much of it is actually triaged by our paralegal. You use your least expensive legal personnel yeah. to handle the matters that they're most qualified to handle. That work has backed up. One of the things and difficulties addressing some contracts that have come through on a rush basis has been our, our paralegal has been very, very badly backed up, in part because we were trying to handle more of our litigation in-house. So what this is is a plan to slowly improve our ability to handle our litigation in-house, reduce the outside counsel expense, that 285 versus 99, uh, and let our second paralegal defray that workload from our first paralegal. We'll have one primarily assisting in litigation and one primarily helping in advisory. I think it's critical in order to achieve that end. With respect to the department assistant position, which is really about .55 of an assistant, um, what we are currently running at is well below the support ratio for assistant to attorney ratio. What this would put us at is approximately a one to three ratio, which is actually an achievement for most private law firms that is sought, and, but they also have um, other clerical staff such as file clerks and receptionists, which we don't have. So we're, we would run that very lean, and that assistant can help our attorneys by help turning around workload that they would not, other, that they would not otherwise have the opportunity to get to they would be typing their own, they would be responding their own, and we can use our assistant to create more effective uh, and efficient workload in the office. So I believe what that, these two positions will do is make our internal services to other departments far more effective and efficient, allow us to bring on more litigation slowly and reduce our outside counsel costs in that regard. One of the things that's happened in outside counsel is some of the litigation that we don't have as much control over is very large, such as the group homes litigation, we wouldn't be in a position to handle anyway. I mean, no small office can take on that type of a mega litigation. And so that's the kind of thing we couldn't handle. But the smaller cases or individualized cases like the CEQA case recently filed against the city or a, another planning case filed and we're currently litigating that was filed in December uh, would be handled in-house. Any other questions, Mr. I, I do. Mr. I guess. Rosansky. Dave, once the group Would you forgive me? I have a correction. I thought that .45 department assistant was authorized. It was authorized by the council last year. I didn't realize it wasn't actually in the budget. So we are asking for a full one department assistant position at that point. I would hope so. Otherwise, that'd be a hundred thousand dollar a year position. Yeah, I I was surprised Quite by the expense. I'd like to be an assistant in your department yeah. if that would be the case. Um, my question is: once we move. I mean, your budget has really ballooned, and I think a lot of it's been attributable to some of the litigation, and the group home litigation in particular. Once we move past some of that, what do you, what's your expectation for their, your, your budget and your department? It, not only for outside counsel, but I mean, I imagine that a lot of resources are taken up within the department, like Kathy Wolcott, for instance. I know she spends a lot of time on it. You spend a lot of time on it. I imagine there's others in the department, the department assistants, apparently. I mean, it must be at all levels. So, Group Homes takes up three of our lawyers' times in one proportion or another and also takes up some assistance, assistance work, uh, when I say assistance, staff assistance as well as some of our paralegals' time. That is an unusual circumstance. I don't think, though, that that will leave us overstaffed when Group Homes goes away because we will be hanging on to the litigation that I think is appropriately handled in-house in part and because, as we tried to demonstrate about a year ago, there's lots of work to get to that we can't get to signs and banners, uh, encroachment permit ordinance. There's a lot of things we're not getting to because we don't have the resources to address them. So when group homes goes away, which is in part what you're actually seeing because this budget was built on the expectation that the group homes trial litigation would be completed early in this fiscal year. 
Yep. And is still anticipated it will end in the early in this fiscal year. If it was going on for another six months beyond when we're anticipating it, the budget would be a great deal higher. Did I answer your question? Okay, so the resources that are currently being tied up with this litigation, and I'm talking about human resources, let's say, Correct. not even dollar resources, are there's really not going to be any freeing up. You're only anticipating shifting them to other things that you deferred um, because you just don't have the bodies to do it. Absolutely. We've got about 200 deferred tasks going back for before I was a city attorney that needed to be addressed, and it's my hope we can get to those. Thank you. So, so. If you if you sort out the special, there were it was group homes and what was the other large litigation uh, expense? In the past, before we settled most of it, it in fact was, settled all of it. The, the IBC litigation. The IBC litigation. Right. If you sort out those two, though, from your budget, what does the shape of the budget look like? I think I gave that report two weeks ago, and I apologize, I don't remember that that number. But what you would see is. What you see in this budget, when I'm looking at this budget, I'm looking at the handout that was given to you regarding our overall expenses. Group homes is, is reflected in our outside council cost, which is specialty litigation, which is at 622 up at the top. I believe our outside council costs would be somewhere in the vicinity, and I actually have a spreadsheet on this, and I apologize for not bringing it, some, somewhere closer to 150 to 200 at tops. That's advisory specialty and code enforcement. The other aspect that you will see is, is that group homes is reflected in the general liability attorney expense non-tort, which is 55000 That was reduced significantly before the recent budget amendment. You had budgeted 250000 for it in this fiscal year. The recent budget amendment lifted it to four forty-four. So, But that was a $200,000 cut. Um, what you will see in fiscal year, let's say, 11-12 is a substantially smaller outside legal expense, I can't speak to the ones you're seeing in 09 down below the line, the other legal costs, because I don't know what those are. And you would see all of your costs being predominantly taken up by our staffing and salaries and other internal costs of the Office of the City Attorney. We gave you those estimates two weeks ago as to what the costs would yeah, be. I, I, I apologize. Can't re I can't remember, but I, my, my recollection is if you sort of, if you exclude the litigation costs relating to IVC and group homes, your outside legal expense would be less this year than last year. Oh, absolutely. And would the de would the amount of that decline in outside legal expense exceed the cost, uh, the internal cost of the the attorneys that are now doing that work? I mean, is it clear well, from the budget numbers? that that is the outcome. Can we objectively support that outcome yes, with the numbers? Yes, we can. That is absolutely true. Okay. Well, I guess um, that's a little bit confusing to me because when you look at the in-house cost, forget about external costs. When you look at in-house cost, we've gone from, from 820000 to $1.39 million in a three-year period, which is a 70% increase in internal costs. So, Neutralize the outside legal. I mean, that's the cost increase of our in-house budget. I, I'm not seeing those numbers, and I don't know where they're coming from. If you'll forgive me, I don't know where you're drawing those numbers from. The 2007-2008 budget and the budget this year. Okay, I see inside legal at 1.6 in 2007-8, which is the total city attorney cost, not taking into account everything else. And that's on this handout that was given to you today that I just found on my desk, and that the city attorney's cost for this f fiscal year inside is 2.3 million, an approximate $700,000 raise. Do we all have a copy of that? No, actually, this is something Councilmember Daigle requested, oh, okay. and I know. Um, uh, Mrs. McCraner was working on it until the last minute, and. Um, sent that up to you. We can make you copies of that same document. Um, I think it would also be helpful because um, I didn't bring my copy of what you did provide us. Uh, <clears throat> was it two weeks ago? Right. If you can find that in, in your office well, or something. Well, but Dave, I mean, to Leslie's point, clearly, I mean, you have twice as many attorneys in that office. You must be paying twice as much in salaries and benefits and all the other stuff. I mean, the, the office has expanded. We've definitely in, in the expanded. last two years. Absolutely, right. we've expanded. There's no question about it. I think that's it. her point. What she's right. making is that there's an extra umpteen dollars that are being spent on in-house. How, how is that reflected in reduction in the outside legal counsel expense? 
or have we seen that yet? You've seen parts of it, and if you look at what's going on for this fiscal year, and again, I'm looking at the summary sheet, but what you will see and what, what you will see from the budget I prepared and presented to the city manager is, is a reduction of overall legal expense by about $240,000 in this fiscal year from last fiscal year before the bump up as a result of group homes litigation while I was out. So that was reflected in retaining all of the code enforcement litigation in-house, retaining all the advisory advisory work that otherwise had been sent out on a regular basis. For example, predating my time, advisory work on all ballot measures, we had a, a we had a retainer agreement with an outside law firm where we paid them a certain amount per month, whether we used them or not. That's been stopped. We reduced the outside counsel expense on both advisory and code enforcement and all specialty litigation with the exception of group homes, where we've been hammered. But let me see if I can take a, a crack at this. I think there's two things going on here, three things really. Setting aside the major litigation expense for group homes and for and for the IBC litigation. Let's set that aside. That's one thing that's been going on. The second thing that's been going on is that you have, you've been trying to execute a strategy here of substituting in-house legal cost for outside legal cost for code enforcement and other particular litigation areas. And then the third thing that's going on is, and council has played certainly a significant role here, you have, you've, you've explained the mission of the city attorney's office and I think there's been, in effect, a council approved expansion in the mission of the city attorney's office from the day that you started, from what it was before you started. So I guess it, if there's, if it's possible to do this, and I recognize we've got limitations because of the historical classifications of the numbers, if it's possible to have a view of, on the one hand, this is how much ex increase in expense due to the council approved mission change for the city attorney's office. On the second hand, this is the amount of impact of the switch to internal handling of litigation versus external, what's the impact associated with that, netting, netting the increased cost of inside capacity against the reduction in outside counsel, and then the last piece is what's been the impact of this particular specialty outside litigation. Do you see those three pieces? Oh, I understand you, what you're saying. Do, do you think it's possible to sort of categorize it in that respect? Yes, I could probably estimate it as best I can. Uh, I'd have to go back to my spreadsheets and pull, bring them. I'd be happy to do that. You see, because that gives council the basis then to go back and say, well, okay, let's have a look at the mission, mm -hmm. and do we still agree that what we have previously approved by way of a mission change and whatnot is still what we want? True. In light of the impact of the actual numbers. Um, I, I think you've hit on the crux of the issue, and that is a mission statement was developed that legal was going to be integrated into the most basic functions of the city. And so that's what was caused expanded review. And I think as Mayor Pro Tem indicated, Hen indicated, you know, maybe we ought to go back and revisit that mission statement in light of the, the budget issues that we have. So I think that that, that mission statement is really is, is an important factor in what's caused an expansion of cost because we have more oversight. Um, and, then, and then the other point is I think in, well, Let's leave it at that. All right. Let me um, just just one other point. I I, I, I want to make sure that it's not my understanding that you've been doing anything other than what council has authorized you to do here. I've only done I mean, what I thought I was supposed to do. Exactly. I mean, you've presented a mission. We approved it. You've executed it. So now I think if we can parse it out in those three ways, it'll give us the opportunity to have another look at it and say, is this still what we want to do? Well. The issue on the table is whether we're going to approve about $160,000 of staff time, of additional staffing resources for the Office of City Attorney for the next fiscal year. That's what we're being asked to decide tonight. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't, <clears throat> I didn't hear any controversy relative to the budget manager or the recreation coordinator or deleting uh, positions from general services. So uh, before we uh, pull this issue, unless someone else has something I'd like to say, is anyone from the public want to speak on this matter? We're going to get to community grants here in a moment. Okay, seeing none, uh, why don't we bring it back then and, and uh, pull the matter is, uh, 
Is there a sense of the council as a straw poll to support these additional budget positions in the office of the city attorney? Those, those in support, please raise your hand. Opposed? No, noted, Councilmember Daigle. Okay. Decision one is done. I'll, and I'll bring information back also. Yes, but I, but I think to the, both the point that Mr. Hinn was making and Councilmember Daigle was making, uh, that there needs to be a, a review of functionality, of staffing, of allocation, of prioritization. And if the council wants to give you a different direction about that, then we should collectively among ourselves do it. Now, I, for one, uh, have made a good living by never trying to be my own lawyer and by listening carefully to the advice I get from those who, who do this for a living. So I think we want to be careful about what we say. But I do think that issue needs to be raised, and we need to bring it back and talk about it. But, uh, Mr. Mayor, I don't think we need to have that information for us tonight. I think that no, would I be think we decided this issue. Okay. I'd be appropriate to yeah. ha give the attorney an adequate amount of time to make sure that the information we get is, is appropriate and accurate rather than trying to be on the back of an envelope and, and cranked out too fast. Right. <clears throat> what I'd now like to do is move to the issue of the community grants. I know we do have members of the public who'd like to speak to that matter. And what might be appropriate here is unless someone would like to speak uh, in advance of that is to invite the representatives of the public to speak on this matter first and then bring it back to the council for discussion, if that's uh, agreeable. That's fine. I just I have Gardner. one question. Is there anybody here from the Balboa Island Historical Society? Okay. That's something I would like to discuss, but I'll wait. Okay. Uh, let me open it up to the public, then, for anyone who would like to speak on the issue of uh, community grants. Uh, those of you seeking money, come forward and ask. <laughs> <laughs> With your hand outstretched, too. Come on, Greg. There you go. S supplicants. Supplicants. Mr. Mayor, uh, Council members, um, I'm Greg Schwank. I'm the executive director and co-founder of the Newport Beach Film Festival. And I just want to start off by saying thank you to the council and uh, to your predecessors for your past support uh, and what has, I think, been a very successful community event and one which has stretched well beyond our community uh, as far as the Newport Beach Film Festival. Uh, I'm here today to uh, request uh, your support in uh, full funding uh, of the festival as uh, suggested and recommended by the Special Events Committee uh, for the City of Newport Beach. And I'm also here to be able to answer any questions you may have about the festival, both in this past year and going forward. Uh, Greg, can you just give us a rundown of, uh, or a summary of attendance this year and, uh, sure. as compared to past years? Uh, I can tell you uh, over the last two years, uh, we've seen extremely strong attendance, uh, 51,000 plus. Uh, and both in, in this 2010-2009, uh, that growth was a 21% increase uh, over past years, which is great for us. And even if you look at uh, both 09 and 010, that outpaces national box office by several percentage points. Uh, furthermore, uh, we look at uh, the response that we're getting from the individuals coming out to the films. Uh, we do an audience award for every uh, feature in short, and the response back from our audience as far as how they grade what we're presenting to them is continuing to increase. So we're, we are working very hard to increase the quality uh, as seen by our, our population. And then, I think most importantly, uh, from our perspective, uh, is the economic and uh, economic impact of what we do, not only through uh, hotel, uh, retail, and uh, restaurant, but also in being able to uh, promote uh, the city of Newport Beach and the Newport Beach Film Festival in a key drive market from L.A. to San Diego and out to the Inland Empire, but also, also on a national level through such partners as Variety, uh, Entertainment Weekly and Esquire magazine. Also for this year, we are fortunate enough uh, to add a new sponsor, which is the LA Times, uh, which gave us a full run uh, through that publication throughout its markets. So we're really seeing a strong push by the, the festival to continue and grow, uh, not only, again, through the quality of our films, but also the outreach uh, to key demographics that are important to our city during the festival and beyond. Any other questions, Mr. Frank? Do you have any information on like how many room nights? Uh, we're we're still compiling some of that, both from the standpoint of our nights. I can tell you, we booked uh, over 400 room nights that we had control over, mm -hmm. 
And we, every other year we do an outside audit uh, by uh, University of California, Irvine, that gives us a better indication of the number of people who are staying that we may not know about. Mm -hmm. And we won't know the numbers from that probably for about another month. But what, I can tell what you. What was that. it two years ago? I mean, uh, so less I mean, than that, yes. I, can, I, I know. I no, can. I know. Uh, well, we'll bo boost it up by the 21% increase right. in attendance. But any idea? Uh, I want to say it, it wasn't about, it about the. We try to hold our numbers that we're paying for in, around in that range, mm -hmm. uh, but it was probably in that 300 range. Mm -hmm. you know, we continued to bump up a little bit depending. Your room nights were 300? Or correct. Or, or, no. or, or I'm saying uh, it was. I'm uh, saying all room nights oh, do sure. that survey. Uh, I want to. Uh, I don't know the exact number for that. Mm -hmm. I can I can get that for you. I, let me. I'm not understanding this. You said there are 400 and some. That we that we the film festival sign the check for that we that we pay for. Oh, okay. So you that uh, okay. The, and then there there are those that come in from all right, over. Right, but you the, you have no idea of that. Okay. Correct. Any questions? Thank okay. you, Greg. Thank you. Good afternoon, Welcome. Mr. Mayor and City Council. My name is Homer Blue Dow. I am a resident of Newport Beach. And I am here uh, representing Irrelevant Week as its executive director. I submitted a proposal for $10,000 for the city council to consider. And I think uh, that speaks to uh, the basics of what we are seeking. Uh, Paul Salata is 83 years old now and Irrelevant Week will, uh, starting next week, will have gone on for 35 years. And that's a pretty amazing stretch for this event uh, to take place and be as successful as it has. And with Paul reaching the age that he is, and he isn't going to have, uh, you know, the energy and the future that he's been able to put into it, he and some of his friends, including myself, have gotten together to try and brainstorm about how we can keep a relevant week alive for many years to come. And since Paul has such uh, good friendships and, and high places in the NFL, we have approached the National Football League in order to form some kind of partnership that will help sustain a relevant week in the future years. In our conversations with uh, the NFL, uh, they are very encouraging, but they wanted to see a couple of things. They wanted to see, make sure that uh, a relevant week was a 501c3. We've submitted our paperwork. Uh, it should be, um, we should receive that designation no later than September of this year. They also wanted to see an executive director, which is why I stepped in. And last but not least, they wanted to make sure that the community supports a relevant week, and we'll continue to do that. As long uh, far after uh, Paul not being able to continue his active support of it. So in order to prove to the NFL that the community really does support a relevant week, I began a fundraising campaign trying to reach uh, $100,000. And the NFL has uh, specifically asked me in our conversations three different times, where, where's the city in all of this? And that's why uh, the request for $10,000 is so important um, to a relevant week and uh, for the, sustaining this event. Uh, the NFL recognizes that for anything to happen and to be successful, it helps to have the uh, uh, city fathers and mothers uh, involved and, and also interested. So if uh, you see fit to uh, give us the $10,000, that will put us at about $85,000, and we think we're going to have successfully reach uh, $100,000. So uh, it, it's very important, and we have a window of opportunity with, uh, with Paul's uh, friends in the NFL. So I hope uh, I'll answer any questions you might have. Um, Homer, your group, it's an all-volunteer group, right? You're not paid as an executive director, right? That's right. Okay. So none of the money is going for salaries. It's just really going for support of the event. Or, that, that is correct. Or, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Homer. Thank you for your consideration. And thank you, Dave, for, uh, for your recommendation. Just one quick question of Greg Schwank. You don't need to get up, but that would be the same for your group as well? Uh, are there paid people now or not? There are, but there, we have no employees. Everyone who is has a small stipend. Okay, so small stipend, but there's no, you don't have a employee, employees or things like that. What small? Uh, next speaker, please. Good 
afternoon, Mayor Curry and members of council. My name is Gary Kutcher. I'm with the OC Marathon. And, uh, and we want to first thank you for uh, your support for the last six years with us. Um, we're coming into our seventh year. Um, we have had tremendous growth the past few years. This last year we went up from um, about 10,000 uh, participants in, uh, in total. Uh, this year nearly 13,000. Uh, that includes uh, 2,000 ch uh, children as part of our Kids Run the OC program. Uh, we have three schools from Newport Beach and hope to, to garner more uh, for next year. Um, and 10% of our 2,000 kids, we have over 200 kids from Newport Beach that participate in that program. Um, we want to thank you also for, for uh, the process we went through and, and it, was, uh, it helped us to, to solidify some of our missions and our thoughts um, and I think it went very well. Um, and we encourage you to, uh, to move forward with the amount suggested uh, by the city manager uh, tonight. Um, other than that, uh, we, uh, we expect to have uh, uh, growth going forward. This past year, we went up 30% over last year. Uh, we feel our numbers are going to go up even more this, this next year, thanks to, uh, to a course that I think is, is, uh, is one of the best on the West Coast. Um, Newport Beach is, uh, is forefront in, in all of our uh, promotional stuff. Um, all of our uh, collateral that we, we print up has Newport Beach photos on it. Newport Beach is mentioned in, in, uh, in all of them. Uh, and you guys, uh, the, the Newport Beach City has been the, uh, the main partner and sponsor, city po uh, sponsor, uh, since the very beginning. So we want to thank you. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. Any questions for Gary? Councilmember Gardner. Yes. Um, you went before the committee, and I don't have my paper in front of me, but um, you didn't get uh, the points that, say, the film festival got. And one of the, th the things that I recall was that they didn't, uh, you weren't, although you have a charitable message, that there wasn't much money moving on to the charities. And yet when I saw the figures that you submitted, there was about $200,000 that went to various groups. So where's the disconnect here? Well, absolutely. Um, what we do is that we, we hold an event. It costs over a million dollars to put our event on. Then we had 21 official charities this past year. Those charities have raised nearly a quarter million dollars. We have our, as our last, we're still compiling those numbers. Um, so that's how they raise money. It's, it's, um, uh, these charities are primarily focused in children's charities, juvenile diabetes and, and different ones. And then they go out uh, with uh, you know, requests from family members and, and everyone, everyone else. And, uh, and raise funds through theirs. We have Cancer for College and American Cancer Society and, 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 and like, like I said, 21 official charities. So there's, they can use their connection with you, but you don't actually give them money. They go out and utilize whatever connection there is to try to raise funds for themselves. Is that That's right? correct. In, okay. in fact, um, a marathon running is, is probably one of the most powerful fundraising tools across the country. Um, a couple of years ago, a study was done and $300 million was raised by PGA Golf, $700 million uh, through charities, fundraising through marathons. So it's a, it's a very, very powerful way to, to raise funds. It's the biggest charitable item for them all year long, um, for, these, or in, for many of them, not all of them. Um, and then uh, we, too, have had uh, great growth with regards to our hotel nights as well. We've um, we documented nearly 500 room nights this year. Um, and we're still getting um, you know, some more information in on, from our charities and, and hotels as well. Um, and we have contracted an economic impact study that we should have within the next four to six weeks, which will really compile everything uh, as far as benefits for the city. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Gary? Mr. Hent? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Gary, at a, at a contribution level of 25000 how does that fit into the sponsorship levels that you've that you've delineated for the event. In other words, is there, is that a uh, copper sponsorship level or a gold or well, a silver? How, how does that work? Well, Where, what are the thresholds? I, I think the recommendation 20, of the city was 20. 20. No, I know that. Yeah. yeah. So how does uh, the 20 fit into that? Last year, as, the, um, um, as a gold sponsor, uh, the city of Newport Beach was given um, all the benefits of that, which includes uh, mentioned on every one of our e-blasts that goes out to 33,000 uh, person database as well as our um, efforts through uh, we have uh, partnerships with other marathons the Long Beach Marathon sends out to their 80,000 person database Newport Beach is mentioned on every one of those as a gold sponsor 
Um, so what the, last year we gave fifty thousand dollars. Was right. that the minimum threshold to be a gold sponsor? Yes, yes. So as a twenty thousand dollars sponsor, there is there are different you know receivables that that would be offered. Um, what we will still do is recognizing our past. We want to make sure that Newport Beach is is um, prominent on all of our collateral. So I don't know that it's going to make a big difference as far as our, our deliverables. We haven't seen exactly what is is uh, going to be give, given to us, and we will be thankful for whatever um, in these economic but, times. But, but twenty thousand dollars isn't isn't doesn't meet a, an, an identified threshold of a sponsorship level in the in the event. Is that right? It is a. Um, because it will probably be called a silver sponsorship, even though it's twenty thousand dollars, even though okay. twenty five thousand is actually the threshold that we've we've okay. made that the uh, the one below that is crystal bronze bronze is underneath that, so oh, not yeah. copper. Well, okay. who are the other large sponsors to the event? Um, we had Neutralite last year as our title sponsor. Um, how other how sponsors much, include what were their sponsorship level amounts? A hundred thousand dollars. Um, and we have not spoke to them yet this year. We had U.S. Bank in at twenty-five thousand. Uh, we had um, uh, Wahoos came in as a, a sponsor for in kind for the five k. Um, other main sponsors. We had the, Hogue. The Hogue event. Came. The event end, uh, ends in Costa Mesa last year. It does. Yes. What was their participation, if any? Uh, they did not. They did not. And, and, and as such, did not have any of the, uh, the receivables that Newport Beach received. Uh, everything, all press releases show as Newport Beach as the, as the marathon. Our host hotels are, are three. We have three host hotels. Two of them are in Newport Beach. Um, the vast majority of the room nights are all in, I mean, uh, 90, 80 percent of them are in Newport Beach. So um, I think that that's where the majority of the benefits, uh, all of our uh, national advertising that we'll be doing even more, all of our e-blasts, all mention um, Newport Beach. So, so uh, not uh, neither Irvine nor Costa Mesa were a cash sponsor. Like That's correct. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Okay, seeing none, we're going to close off then the public comment. We'll bring it back to the council for uh, straw polling relative to the uh, to the uh, community grants, Councilmember Carter. Um, first of all, I feel that since we we have asked our residents to uh, accept something uh, slightly below our platinum service that we we like to promise because of our budget cuts, we have asked our staff to to take cuts. And so I think that it's uh, only right that we ask that we expect some of these individuals also to participate in a little bit of the pain that uh, this economy uh, is bringing. Hopefully, as we say, it's recovering. Um, I'd like to go, if you don't mind, one by one, because I have questions on a number of them. Go ahead and start. All right. Uh, the, can somebody explain to me what the Balboa Island Historical Society does, uh, how many people visit it, um, what, what this, this money goes to? Because it seems a little odd to me that, I mean, we have a Newport Beach Historical Society that's getting to relaunch itself. Um, but we certainly couldn't afford to support a, the Crown Del Mar Historical Society and the Beacon Bay Historical Society and that sort of thing. So what is the, the mission and what are they doing and what's worth $15,000? Well, I had uh, the Historical Society, I don't know if you brought that, Dave, submit uh, a justification for their request that explains uh, what the money's for and uh, what the benefit to the city is from it. Do we, do we have that here? I can go back and get it. Um, yeah, yeah I, I didn't add it to your packet, and I don't have it with me. All right, because with, without justification, yeah. I don't see how I can support it at, at this level. I just don't know what, is, what the money's going for. Um, the Balboa Island Improvement Association, is that another name for the bid, Ed? No. No, that's the Balboa Island Improvement Association. It's the association that actually has been in existence since the early 1900s. They were responsible for setting up assessment districts for the original sewers, and I believe a lot of the bulkheads on Belleville <coughs> Island. Maybe you know more than that, Don, yeah, that but I think that's why what they, they started. That's why they set up is the, the original, uh, Mr. Collins uh, uh, kind of flaked out on a lot of what he was supposed to be done, and, and one of the ways to get it done was through the improvement. 
associate owner assessment district. It's basically you can the, find homeowners, the homeowner it's association the homeowner for the island. the island. You can find that all out at the museum. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, well, I mean, here again, we have uh, a, cons you know, a number that, that in another village, say Crown del Mar, and I don't know about in Balboa Village, but these expenses are paid from the bid funds. And one of the things that, that I mean, obviously, many of these depend upon because we have built up this practice of every year you come and we go, oh, yeah, we've already get, always given it to you. It seems to me, though, that we should have a start to establish a policy of weaning uh, a number of these off and say uh, at least re reducing the amounts we give them over a period and saying at some point you're going to have to be self-funded. So, um, I mean, again, this seems like... Well, again, <laughs> anticipating this kind of discussion, I asked the BIIA to, again, submit justification for the request to the okay. city manager. I look forward to seeing that. I'll go back and get them. Yeah, um, the chamber, I, I have no problem with reducing their amount. I mean, I think that's, again, we have to share the pain. Uh, the film festival, um, I think it's worthwhile. But again, I, I'm perfectly willing to, to cut them if we all agree on that. I think we're locked into the Newport Dance and Auto Race. Is that my understanding? Yeah, and as you mentioned that, there's a typo in the note. Uh, they are contracted at 20,000, which is the number in the chart, not 25 as the number in the note. So okay. the chart's correct. Um, and then the race of the cure, we also have made that agreement for this year. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and I would agree with, with the marathon. Uh, I, I think that, again, they're running through our streets, and that's great, and we do get some coverage, but I think that we have to look at all these, these figures. So. Um, those are my thoughts, and I, I would look forward to the to the justifications the, uh, for the the first two. Okay. Any other comments, Mr. Selich? No, I don't have anything. Okay. Any, any other comments? Um, I appreciate what Nancy has said about sharing the pain and all that, and, and I would like to see that information about the stroke site and the improvement association. Um, I will, though, speak in favor of um, reestablishing the full grant for the film festival, because I do think it's a um, I mean, it sells the brand of Newport Beach, and I think that's more important now than, than ever, to bring people into the community to spend money here, to vacation here. And they may not come at the film festival time. They may just come at other times because of something they've heard or seen. Um, you know, it's, I, I wish Gary uh, Sherwin was here from the Conference and Visitors Bureau because he could speak a little bit to that too. But I think the fact that they received 100 points out of, what, 100 points? Is that... The, mm -hmm. the scale yes. from our committee that we've set up now to review these requests and make recommendations to us speaks volumes as far as the, the benefit to our community of this event. So, um, you know, I've I think all the council members here have attended the event and you can see the, the, the goodwill I think it brings to our city. It does bring in, I think, some revenue. I don't know that it brings in $100,000. I look forward to the to the study that um, Greg, uh, is, uh, his group, is, is doing. But, um, you know, I know that they've had other challenges with other sponsors. Um, and I'd hate to, I'd hate to see, I, I think the event is kind of at a turning point here as far as either it's going to become something really good or it may just disappear over time. And so I, I'd hate to, um, I mean, I think it's something really good now. It seems <laughs> right. something. Even greater and better. We take it to the next level. Would you settle for a hundred? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, those are good points, and, and I yeah. can go along with that. Um, I did have one question, though. On the I forgot on Restaurant Week. This is the the fifty thousand that we didn't spend last year. <laughs> that they didn't spend last year. Is that's that the correct. Same? Okay. Yes. All right. And that's another one that I think that we should be talking about, beginning to wean themselves and becoming more self-supporting. Yeah, there was a recent article in the paper uh, concerning the county restaurant week uh, being funded for around $35,000 a year. And I, it would seem like to me that uh, it's a much larger market than this one, and we really ought to be uh, looking at our restaurant associations, uh, cutting down a little bit on whatever, and bearing some of the burden. Mr. Hand. Yeah, well, in, in that respect, I think there is another view of Restaurant Week to the effect that this is, in fact, a $50,000 reduction because the, the previously approved 100000 there was an event eliminated and associated with that. And so over a two-year period, in fact, there is a $50,000 reduction for Restaurant Week. So I think there is, in effect, a start along the path that you were suggesting. 
even though it doesn't show up in these numbers. I guess um, I do support your questioning about these first few items on the, uh, on the list. I'm not quite sure what we do about that in terms of a decision this evening. But with regard to following on to Council Member Rosansky's comments about the Newport Beach Film Festival, which I support, I, I going the other side, I, I wonder about the OC Marathon because while I think it's a fine event and I do recognize that it is a vehicle for others to raise money, and uh, I don't doubt uh, some of that. On the other hand, we, do, we had this committee that we put together to assess it and its benefit to the community and to, to do that kind of analysis. I read that report. They have a bit of a different view about the exposure to the community that we get out of that event than perhaps Gary might, but uh, that's understandable. But I, you know, it did not reach the threshold for s community support. It scored 50 points, and the and the committee that we had, um, you know, in its own mind at least, established 70 points as a threshold for funding. And so it would not. I, I would not have a problem um, as perhaps a help to funding the increase, uh, the rest restoration of the, in of the amount for the film festival of zeroing out the Orange County Marathon amount. Um, I don't, you know, okay. it's no fun to be a bad guy here, but, I, but we, we do have a committee that was formed to give us that advice, and I'm happy to follow it. I would, I would just point out Mr. Kipp has had the uh, most impossible job of trying to cut money out of the most popular programs in the city, uh, even though they're relatively small, that they are important to a lot of people, and a lot of people in the community who participate in them. Uh, I share my colleagues' support of the film festival. I do believe that's an investment in our community that, uh, that pays a big dividends. Uh, and in the interest of moving these things along and getting some consensus, I would propose, uh, and we'll also f discuss separately the issue of the marathon, but I would propose a $100,000 grant to the, uh, to the film festival, and let me see if there's consensus on that. Okay, I think there's consensus on that point. And then Mr. Hen has suggested whether or not the marathon should be cut. Uh, uh, I appreciate the comments and the review that uh, took place by the Special Events Committee, but uh, uh, it, it may be that we just simply have a different type of event than, than really fit into their criteria, and I would support personally the $20,000. So. Uh, would you like to propose a, a zeroing out? I'll propose it. I'll propose a zeroing out. Mr. Hinn has proposed a zeroing out of the marathon. Is there support for that proposition? And I count three votes. Okay. I'm going to reserve my decision for this evening. All right. So we'll bring the we'll bring the marathon and the Balboa Island Historical Society and the BIIA uh, back for discussions during the council meeting. And now let's move to. Uh, additional items, and why don't we take the issue of the Balboa Theater and the directional signage now. I know we have people in the audience for that, so let me invite people who'd like to speak on that matter to come forward. And we'll deem the other items on the, on the community checklist uh, resolved. Mayor Curry and members of the council, as a, I'm Marion Bergeson, a resident, a very satisfied resident of Newport Beach for 52 years. And I'm also a, a very, very satisfied member of the board of the foundation for the Balboa Performing Arts Theater. Uh, enthused about the role that the theater can play in providing for a venue that's uh, very versatile, providing for many types of activities and also community, arts, education. And more importantly, I think, the theater can play a vital role in the revitalization of historic Balboa. And you know, that's an issue that uh, many in Newport Beach are very much interested in. We have a very enthusiastic and committed board who have worked long and hard on this issue. As you know, it's not a new issue but it's one that I think has been revitalized by the enthusiasm of the board. And we have with us Craig Smith, Seth Siegel, and Joe King, who are members of our executive committee. And I'm sure they're happy to respond to any questions that you might have. I know you've received a packet of information, and we don't want to take your time. And so my remarks are very, very brief. And just speaking in support of the project and knowing that uh, it can do a lot for Newport Beach in many ways, 
and we've also already gone through the Coastal Commission permit, which as you know is a major hurdle, and we're ready to go. We do need the, the city's support on this, and uh, if you're able to accommodate on this, I assure you that uh, you're going to see a project that we can all be very proud of, and revitalization of that area I think is certain to take place. So thank you very much for your attention, and if you have any questions, uh, we'll certainly try to respond to them at this time. Hi, questions? I Mr. Mersansky. Hi, Marianne. How are you doing? Um, you know, Marianne, how long has this effort been going on now? Well, I've been here for 52 years, and I think it started <laughs> about that time. <laughs> really? That long ago? <laughs> I'll, call it, I'll call it at least 10 years, at least that I'm aware of. Um, and I, I guess I'm curious, because I, there's a lot of names associated with this um, fundraising effort. And it's been going on a long time. I mean, the city bought this building, like I said, it got to be 10 years ago. Um, and uh, and I'll be honest with you, I've never I've never not supported it, but I've never been a big I've never thought that this was the right place to do what you folks want to do. I'll be honest with you. And uh, my understanding of it was is that the city's contribution was purchasing the building, and I think we lease it to you guys for a, year, a dollar a year or something, or give it to you. I don't know how you guys get it. And and now, you know, we're going to make an additional commitment here of $175,000, and you're still millions of dollars short of your goal. I mean, you spent, you, I guess, raised $3 million, but and I'm sure it's been spent on, on things, necessary things, over the years. But, you know, the building's still the building, and not much is, not, I haven't seen anything yet that would convince me that this is going to be, even if you get it built, that it's going to be a viable thing in the long run. And I, I need I need to know why do you think that this is going to get the, the support not only to get the finishing funds because uh, my fear is okay we're going to get you into building permits one hundred seventy five thousand dollars and then a year or two from now you're still going to be short money because the money is just not going to be there and I don't know why with this many influential people behind this project and I'm friends with a lot of them. I don't understand why the money has not been committed, why you're even needing $175,000 from the city. If there's that level of support in the community, these people could, I mean, there's people on your board that could write the check for this thing, literally, and be done with it. So I guess, can you explain that to me? Because I, I just don't understand. <laughs> well, first of all, I think that the, the commitment is there that, frankly, with the design work completed and with our permits that we can hopefully get through the city, that we'll be ready to go. This will be a trigger then. I think we have uh, partial commitments from very, inf very influential and very uh, financially capable supporters who I think will step forward at that time. But I think it also has to go in concert with the revitalization of that area. And this can be a major focal point in really initiating that. And as you know, the Heritage Museum or the uh, Nautical Museum is uh, committed also to a large portion of improvement in that area. I think generally it's going to speak well for the efforts that many of the city fathers in the past, fathers and mothers, <laughs> have really tried to do what I think we can do now. I think it's the time, I think it's appropriate, and I think the money will come. We have a board that is totally committed, and uh, the board is uh, consists with people who have the means to be able to be influential. I think in doing the fundraising is necessary. But this really is the trigger that will that'll really start the ball rolling. We feel confident at that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Just okay. Um, uh, Ms. McGarner. I was dubious also. Um, although I, I just, I guess for me, I, I was looking, I was reading some of my father's things and back when Balboa was body and that sort of thing. And it was the only game in town. Um, and that's one of the reasons it was so popular. I mean, if you wanted to gamble, you wanted to drink, you came to Balboa because uh, from Presbyterian Fullerton, you couldn't, <laughs> you couldn't find those things. Um, it's not the only game in town now. I mean, we've got every neighborhood has a bar and a restaurant and that sort of thing. And so you almost, to revitalize that village, you really do need a destination type of thing, something that brings in people from outside as well as the local support. So I, I do think that um, it's important, and I, I know it's, it's been frustrating. I mean, we have, I was on the board, and it was like, well, we're going to get 
a professional board, and then we're going to do it. And then we're going to get past the Coast Commission. And so the triggers come, and the triggers have not worked as well. I think one thing that's been lacking is a sense of urgency. So one thing I would like us to consider between now and this evening when we talk about it is putting some kind of time frame on it, just saying, hey, this happens in this period, or it doesn't happen. And perhaps that kind of deadline will get some of these people who have been standing on the, on the sidelines with, with their money, realizing that the city's not going to sit here forever <coughs> with a dollar a year rent, and we need to get it done sooner rather than later. So that's just something that we might consider. Thank you. Are you talking about with regard to the 175000 or just in general? Uh, in general, working that in with it. Okay. With them, are there, are there other terms of the dollar a year lease? Here's Sharon's chair. So. Uh, there is a lease. It's not a dollar a year. It's a no-cost lease. Uh, to answer Council Member Rosansky's question from before, I think the city acquired the property in 1997 or 98. Um, the first lease didn't have um, any deadlines in it, and so when we amended the lease for some other reasons that I can't even remember now, a few years ago, we tried to tighten up a performance schedule. At that point, the theater was considering the option of, um, rather than going up to provide their extra space, going down and, and excavating. And we were really concerned about having a hole in the ground that would last forever. Um, so they weren't actual dates or times from today when things would be done, but it was tied to their raising of funding, and there was a trigger for um, the Coastal Commission permit, which they have now achieved. So from my perspective of having worked on it on a while, for a long while, I think that having some tighter deadlines would be very helpful. Thank you. Uh, is there, is there anyone else? Do you know how long the lease is left? Or, I mean, is there a time period or not? There is not a time period. So they just have a lease in perpetuity, or how is that? Yes. Uh, it's, there are termination provisions. I don't remember what they are other than breach. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Let me ask, is there anyone else from the public that would like to speak on this matter? Okay. Uh, bring it back, Mr. Hinn. Well, I, you know, the, the Balboa Village is the historical center of Newport Beach in many ways, culturally, and the revitalization of the village is, is a prime goal here for me and, and as expressed by the Council in the priority setting sessions that we've had. I really view the Nautical Museum and the Balboa Theater as the twin anchors for that possibility to revitalize Balboa Village, not as a place for more tattoo parlors and t-shirt shops, but as a new view of how to have a good time with your family, with your kids, maybe learn something along the way, and <clears throat> in an environment that's very family friendly. And the mission of the theater, if you go through the detail of it, is very much aimed in that direction. It will provide a venue for very high quality professional type performance in a small theater venue that doesn't really exist in Newport Beach today and through its affiliations with proposed affiliations I should say with the Pacific Symphony, Symphony and uh, the Performing Arts Theater and beyond that connections with the schools uh, to really get kids involved all the way down to very small children to be involved in an interactive way in the performing arts and I see it as a niche in the arts scene that is missing here in Newport Beach that would be very well fulfilled by this. The, it's to address some of your concerns, uh, Steve, about this. It is a gamble, this 175000 as is the 175000 that is being put up by the board to help this work. Uh, and as were the $3 million of donations that preceded it. And, and uh, while it is a gamble, I think it's well worthwhile for the potential outcome of maturing this to an $8 million asset and, a, and an important addition on going to the art scene in Newport Beach, which in my view is, needs help. We need a richer, fuller, broader arts scene in Newport Beach. And so for all of those reasons, I think it's a gamble that is well worthwhile. And, um, 
would support it. Uh, we can certainly consider issues regarding the lease and that sort of thing. Uh, can I? Can we? So. Can we test and see if we if it's if we have a consensus on this matter so we can move on or well just to, comments that we like to, to your Mr. point Rosansky? and then I, okay. I think we should do that. I, I mean, because you bring up the nautical museum and obviously this is the other building block of, of the new revitalized peninsula, but they have not come to the city for any money as far as I'm aware of and they've I mean, they purchased a property down there, spent millions of dollars to do that. They've got a, 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 a program for construction and expansion, which I believe is self-funded. I don't think that they're planning on coming to the city for us. So I see the community support for that, or they've managed to tap into a level of community support in much less time, certainly, than 12 or 13 years since we purchased this property. And I, my concern is I don't see, although, like I said, there's a lot of people whose names are associated with this project, I have not seen, you know, people talking with their wallets, I guess. Well, well at, I, at least to the extent that we need them to. And that's not what concerns to the, me. Not to the extent that's ultimately needed, but they've talked with their wallets to the tune of $3,175,000 so far. That's not an insignificant amount of money. And although the Nautical Museum didn't ask us to buy the Balboa Market property, we certainly did that with, for, to the tune of three and a half million dollars uh, for the possibility of facilitating that development. So I agree, but they also were willing to write a check to us even before we purchased it, as well as help fund the parking structure to the extent that they're going to use it. So I, I agree, and, and, I, and I think the city would have bought that piece of property regardless of the nautical museum. Okay. So I, my point is I, I'm going to support this. And I, apparently, I'm 50, reluctantly. <laughs> reluctantly, I, I'll admit it. Reluctantly, because I am not. I'm not convinced after 13 years that they're going to cross the finish line here. And so, I guess what I'm saying is, if you're going to come back in the next two years That's while I'm on city council, you better be able to show me a way that you're going to cross the finish line because I'm not going to support it again. I guess um, that would be my point. Well, I just say, you know, Harvard dredging was languishing for about 72 years, <laughs> and we're pulling that off, and it's on the agenda tonight. So. The fact that things have been lagging for a long time, I think now is, is the time to step up to those challenges, so I'll be supporting it. All right, let's, uh, let's uh, straw vote this, please. All in favor of supporting the $175,000 allocation. And let me make sure, Mr. Kiff, because this is a little bit different. This is coming from uh, money fund balance available at the close of the 0910 budget, so it's not part of next year's budget. Is that the, the, the game plan here? Uh, Technically, we would probably uh, – actually, I might have to ask Tracy to help me out here. How would we handle that? Is it a um, – we'd probably – actually, go ahead. <laughs> Thank but you. I'm not the best okay. <laughs> No, our intent is uh, to take from additional savings. We haven't got our final numbers yet in the event that we don't quite make the mark because we've um, – we're confident on the 1.5 and we've had some um, good signs the last couple months revenue we're still finalizing so hopefully we're not to touch any fund balance but another option is we do have the start video reserve um, which is available I believe it's a couple hundred thousand dollars three hundred thousand dollars so we are also asking that you consider letting us use that all right but mechanically we would would we amend the coming years budget um, and come back to council with that one action or how do you see this Yes, we're going to come back to council and let you know our ending fund balances so we could take care of the action at that time. I see. All right. All in favor of the 175? All right. Appears unanimous. Thank you. I, I do have one follow-on question, though. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. I know you're in a hurry here. But, but uh, when will we know that? Because the theater needs to be able to know when they can move forward. Right now, we have the money in the start video. So we would okay. amend the current uh, year's right budget then. Yes. Okay. So, so the theater, presuming this is all finalized tonight, as we expect, uh, then the theater knows they have a commitment they can rely upon. Yes. Okay. What exactly is the smart start video reserve? Dave, no I'm kidding. The start <laughs> the start video is a reserve that was established last year in relation to fire. Susan. It's several. Uh, Several years ago is my okay. understanding, but I think it was officially put yeah. in um, last year, but it never got into the formal council policy, and it's uh, what is it? In? Triage? A triage video that we sell, so it hasn't been earmarked specifically by council, but that was going to be the intent. Right. But 
nothing else, we've broken up another slush fund. <laughs> All right, Wayfair, Wayfaring Sign Program. Uh, the issue here is whether or not we would appropriate up to $250,000 for the signs. I will, uh, is there anyone from the public who'd like to speak on this? I, I would just open the conversation by saying, well, I'm a big supporter of the Wayfarer Sign Program. We discussed this at the EDC, and the cost per sign worked out to something I seem to recall in the order of about 1500 bucks. And if that's the case, I'd like to be in the sign business. I think we can do this for a lot less than what this is, this, this is costing. And frankly, if there's anything in the budget, we should be looking at these six-figure items. And this is one that I think needs to be deferred until we're in a better budget situation, which would be my suggestion. I, I would agree with it. I think that this is a, a nice-to-have item rather than a have-to-have item. And I, I would – I really think that we need to look at it in a little more detail because $250,000 for signs on the peninsula, which is dead-end, and you only have two attractions, the Newport Pier and the Balboa Pier, to drive to get people off to one side or the other. I, I just can't feel that. What are you talking about? We have the Nautical Museum and the new Performing Arts Center. How many that we're signs? Have down there. How many signs can you put up Come on. in a two-block area? You got a ferry down there too. But it's for that the city as a whole, is, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That, I mean, that's it is not just for the program, peninsula. Not, not just the peninsula. But even so, I don't. I can't support it right now. I agree that this is something that can wait. We have so many signs up now, you can't read them all. We don't need any more. The point is we'll get rid of all the ones that don't match and people can't figure out. Uh, <laughs> so so just to sound a, uh, the other side of the story here for a moment, uh, in the first place, the Economic Development Committee did consider this and did recommend unanimously that the city consider funding this program and going forward. I'm surprised to hear some of the comments that I've heard just now because I thought this program was developed with full council understanding and support and debate. That was an old council. I guess. Well, I think some of the people sitting up here, maybe even some that just made some comments, were around when we did decide that we wanted to do this program. And so, so I thought we wanted to do this program. <laughs> and. We, we have it to a point now where it is ha and has been ready to go but been deferred. I do agree with the concerns about the cost. And so what, what I would hope is if we do conclude that we want to defer, that it, we defer with an action plan here to develop um, the most – a current view of the costs that perhaps we can come back with at a late – at a date not long from now. Right that we can reconsider this and move this forward because it does play to the economic environment and vitality of the, of the city, which I thought – which I know the Economic Development Committee is in support of and I thought council had been supportive. So um, to the extent that we can identify a better level of cost and perhaps if we can identify a little more uh, financial flexibility as we go forward, maybe there will be an opening to bring this back sometime soon. Well, I, I would certainly support the staff looking at the cost of this program and looking at how the cost can be reduced. And uh, sometime during the course of the mid-year, as revenues uh, justify uh, the ability to take on additional expenditures, consider bringing that back up for uh, council consideration. Well, we ought to decide to either do it or, or get rid of it. It's kind of like the stepchild that kicks around every year and we never, we never seem to fund it. And uh, well, we're either going to do it or not do it. Um, yeah. If, if we had the funds available as is outlined in the, in the budget proposal, I'd be in favor of, uh, of moving ahead with it. Yeah, I, I would too. I think it's something this Chamber of Commerce pretty much asks us about every year. Um, they consider it important to visitors and to the economic development of the community. So maybe there's three votes for it. Well, let's find out if there's four. Well, okay. Mr. Well, I, was, I think I'm one of the older council, older <laughs> council people that did support this project. And although I'm one of the younger council members, um, <laughs> I'm glad we got that clear. No, what I would say is, I'll be honest with you. I haven't seen this project in a long time, I mean, and I'd like to have a, a fuller presentation again of what the project is, what the signs look like, 
uh, you know, there were some changes in the signs. We tested some signs, some si and we changed the look of the signs. I don't even remember where all the signs are going anymore or what the signs are going to look like. So I, I am in favor of the wayfinding project, and I agree that I think the chamber does support it. Um, I think the, the, the Visitors Bureau supports it. There's a lot of support for it, but I would like to see it come back again in a full presentation and, and a full discussion. Can we so do does that, that mean you uh, support appropriating the money? You just kind of want to work to refine what the costs are going to be? I, I, mm, well, the, the question is going no. to be, because this is a budget discussion, whether we're going to include the $250,000 in the budget. And I would, as one of the guys who was well, not quite as old as Mr. Rosansky, but <laughs> older perhaps in age, and who was here and who supports the, the signs, uh, you know, we're cutting $18 million out of the budget, and that means there's a lot of things that I support that are not going to get funded this year, and this, in my opinion, should be one of them, but let's find out. So those who are in favor of supporting uh, the appropriation of $250,000 for the Wayfair signs, please raise your hand. Here's one. In this Two. budget cycle? In this budget cycle. This current one, yeah. not yeah. next budget cycle. Okay. No, it's the one we're voting on, which yeah. is starting in, in the 1st of July. No, no. Are we, is it, well, again, well, I guess it goes back. Are we talking about the 09 10 year. budget cycle? You're the swing vote. Don't get flustered. Just go like this. No, well, I, I guess what I'm saying what is. What budget cycle are we talking about? I, I don't support Bureau. it if we're not going to see it back here at council again to, because I don't know exactly what I'm supporting anymore. So <laughs> I'd like to, if you want to put it in the budget, but we're going to vote we're on it when the contract comes for awarding the signs, yeah. I guess we're, maybe I could agree to that. Remember, like if, you're, we're talking about if you're appropriating something at the end of this year, which you could do, it will necessarily reduce fund balance available for next year. So it does affect both budgets. The question is, do you do it in this one or next one? I, I get with, without injecting too much of my own opinion in this, I kind of like the thought of refreshing everyone's memory about what this is. We could do that fairly early. If yeah, you like. I, I, we so could do that in um, arguably the second meeting in July, maybe. And I'll, and, okay, and perhaps that could be a budget amendment. And it could be a budget amendment. Yeah. Well, time. and perhaps around that time, you'll know where we are with regard right. to the 2010 finish up on the budget we would. and yes. understand so where we have flexibility. Yeah. So I'll say I generally support the thing, but I want to. All right. Make sure I'm supporting the right thing. Great. See you in July with that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. As, right. the, as the oldest of the oldest, <laughs> I, s I sort of supported older than the dirt, last time, you? but I really didn't. It's that old, <laughs> oh, it's that old sort of supported thing. <laughs> Mr. Mayor. Mr. Selich. Yeah, just, just so we don't have to come back and go through this community cash grants again, I'm going to make a suggestion. The, uh, the letters of request from the Historical Society and the Balboa Island Improvement Association were passed around to the council. I'm going to suggest that we cut the recommended allocation here to uh, $12,000 for the uh, Historical Society and $10,000 for the Improvement Association. Um, I think they're worthwhile activities and I think that shows that they're taking a little bit of the pain as well as everyone else. Uh, ten thousand or twelve thousand for the historical society and in ten thousand for the Belleville Island Improvement Association. You know that's about a fifteen yeah. percent cut from last year. One thing I'd say about the bridge, I think those flowers just add so much to the city, you just get a real bang for your buck. I mean, why are we even consider that a community association thing versus more of a city <laughs> infrastructure improvement? Well, well the the, the Proposals on the floor. I actually support that on the grounds that we need to move forward because I'll the support that the dollar too. amount, the more we talk about it. Okay. Yeah. Councilmember Gardner. I, and I think that was those points were very well well said. Oh, uh, I'm still one of theirs. Huh? Let's let's go to the budget checklist. Uh, <laughs> So remember, Council, this is something that we, we do ask you to adopt tonight. Um, arguably, you've, what the steps you've taken in uh, straw voting the position checklist and the community cash grants affects the budget checklist, which is why it's in that order. So I guess what I direct you to, to your question specifically, and it may be short, is if there's anything that we haven't talked about at all in the position checklist or the community cash grants checklist that appears on here, we're happy to answer your questions. You will have to approve this tonight, though. Um, well, one thing we didn't talk about is attachment B, reclassifications. 
Does that sort of fold into this checklist or is that apart from that? Well, well again, tr traditionally that is part of the larger budget. So if you had a specific question about that or I, I know Councilmember Gardner asked for more detail. I'm hoping we can turn that around by that time. Okay. And Especially not, relating to the increment between someone's being reclassed up or down, what's the salary savings? Yeah, my question pertains to um, reclassifying six utilities technicians. Um, it just seems to be a salary increase by another name. They're now going to be senior technicians. There's no change in responsibility. And, you know, the council, we've taken a really strong firm position, no salary increases. And it, it just seems to me that, you know, going, calling them senior and paying them more money, I don't see a change in responsibility. And, um, and, and I realize it's the Water Enterprise Fund and, and those rate increases pay for this. But I... I I didn't support that rate increase, and I, I just <coughs> have an issue with this reclassification. Well, that's that's an issue for the budget, which we should discuss. Right now, we're going to talk about this checklist, though. Now, you want when we discuss the budget uh, tonight? Yeah. Uh, Mr. City Manager, do you want to walk us through these points here? Are there are there points to be made on this? So the budget checklist will include what you've just straw voted, um, and, and uh, what it does is it adjusts things to the printed budget that the public has seen. So there's a couple things in there. Um, we're refunding the, an, the assistant city manager position to take it out of the water fund. I used to oversee more of that, and that's not the role anymore. Uh, the other things that will increase some, um, some of our revenue estimates. Um, uh, basically, it, it, it's a summary of those things. I don't know that I'd have any more to offer than that unless you had a specific question. Are there questions something. on the uh, this remaining checklist, Mr. Hinn? Yeah, I'm, I'm, of course, in favor of the Civic Center and Marina Park, but these, uh, what, what gave rise to these adjustment amounts of 500 and 750? Mr. Batum or Mr. Webb are here, I think, are prepared to address that. I know Mr. Webb is, just in case. Right, Dave? Don't let me down. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we actually uh, added this in. There's a couple of things. On the Civic Center, this is just some additional cash. We have consultant uh, contracts that we have to uh, put on to make the ongoing operation of the, the construction go forward. So we're adding a little budget money. I think it's a half million dollars in that. The Marina Park project, um, I didn't budget enough in the current budget. We looked at the contracts. We're about to bring your design co uh, contracts to you probably in the next month, and we're going to need additional money. And I also know that the SCE property is now going to be going through. They're telling us that they're going to accept that. So I want to make sure we have enough money to go ahead and forward with that. We've reached an agreement with Well, Edison. we've we've looked at each other and I and said we think we agree. So On a dollar amount. Um, yes, and we'll try to get that to you as soon as we can get the purchase and sale agreement through the city attorney's office working with them right now. That's great progress. It's Are there any, uh, <laughs> any other questions on the checklist? Uh, is there a concurrence with the council for the checklist has uh, submitted? Yes. All right. So done. So I think the only item we haven't resolved is the uh, marathon. Mr. Rosansky, do you want to raise any additional questions on that? or No, I'll, I want to think about that until tonight. All right, we'll discuss the marathon tonight uh, in council meeting. Thank you. Uh, anybody else from the public who would like to speak on budget issues? Mr. Kiff, have I forgotten anything we need to do here? I don't believe so, Mr. Mayor. Okay, seeing no one to speak. Is there anyone who would like to speak on public comment on anything not on the agenda? Okay, seeing none, we will adjourn to uh, closed session.